All right, what do chaperone proteins do? Well, one thing that we don't really talk about in the book is protein folding, which is a pretty important topic, although honestly not very likely to show up in your step one. The amino acids in proteins fall into a few different categories, and we'll get into this more in the metabolism section, but they can be negative, positive, or uncharged, and they can also be polar or nonpolar. The polar ones like to hang out together, and the positive ones like to stick to the negative ones, and vice versa. So we have to get from this sequence of amino acids into a complicated three-dimensional shape, like our ubiquitin protein here, which, by the way, is not a chaperone protein. So how might these fold? Well, glutamate is negatively charged, and lysine over here is positively charged, so maybe they'll try to stick together. But wait, the arginine at this end is also positively charged. So how does the glutamate know which one it should be attracted to? It's like a molecular love triangle. So ultimately, the protein will be happiest in a certain shape, but sometimes needs a little bit of help to get there. So here's a question for you. If you have a protein floating around in the cytoplasm of a cell, do you think the polar amino acids like to be on the outside of the protein or buried in its core? Well, the polar ones like to be around water, so they'll be on the outside. However, if there's a protein with mostly nonpolar amino acids on the outside, where do you think you might find it? This would probably be embedded in the cell membrane, since nonpolar amino acids are happy around lipids. So here's an example, a sodium-potassium pump. Chaperone proteins are there to direct folding of other proteins so that they end up in the right structure. Depending on the protein, they can do this in a few different ways, but one way is to form a large, multi-protein chaperone structure, kind of like a barrel, that newly synthesized proteins can be imported into, and once inside, they're able to fold much more easily, because the polar amino acids in the inner wall of this barrel help to push all the non-polar amino acids in our new protein towards the inside. Alright, so why are chaperone proteins important? Well, first of all, improperly folded proteins can cause disease. Things like protein aggregation that you see in Alzheimer's disease or amyloid deposits that you learn about in the pathology chapter are caused by misfolded proteins. The last thing I want to touch on are a type of chaperone proteins called heat shock proteins. In a hotter environment, particularly in single-celled organisms or cold-blooded animals, but also in humans to some extent, proteins are less likely to fold properly. So heat shock proteins are created in response to heat shock, like if you jump into a hot tub, to prevent misfolding of proteins. The example we give in the book is heat shock protein 60, so named because of its 60 kilodalton size. And this protein is used in the structure shown here. Do you recognize this? Right, that's a mitochondria. So remember, most proteins in the mitochondria are made outside of the mitochondria and have to be imported into it. And once they get there, heat shock protein 60 helps them fold into the right shape.